Knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731 1230. That's 731 1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1 866 820 that's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Hi, welcome everybody. This is the Weekend Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, today in our studio, we have Green Therapeutics, LLC, we have Dr. Duke Fu. He is a CEO of Green Therapeutics. Um, Dr. Drew Fu, he is the president of Green Therapeutics. And Joey Aronetta, he is the lead horticulturist from Green Therapeutics LLC. Welcome, guys. How are you doing? Thank great. you. Doing great. Thank you. Thanks well, exciting us. times, huh? Exciting times. You guys, um, you guys got a cultivation and production uh, licenses. How many did you get? We ended up getting two production licenses and two cultivation licenses. And those are in North Las Vegas and an unincorporated clerk? That's right. So do you guys have a lot of building and uh, build outs to do or how, how far are through the process are you? Yes, we are definitely elbows deep in designing and architecture and redesigning. Uh, we're getting very close to the uh, uh, start of construction for one of our facilities. Right on. That's great. That's great news, you guys. Um, uh, I'd like to talk to you, um, Dr. Drews or Duke. What's your background and um, what do you feel that you guys bring to this particular industry? Well, my, my background is in nuclear pharmacy. Um, we, it's essentially we would make radioactive medication for hospitals and we'd compound it, manufacture and deliver to hospitals. And so there's a lot of several areas where that kind of dovetails. It's very highly regulated, yes. you know, it's medical. Um, so I, I think, it, I think this kind of goes back to like best practices. Uh, the more best practices from other industries we can bring, I feel the, the better it'll be for patients in the end, in the long term. Right on. All, all right. Um, well, Dr. Drew, so what's your background? Uh, my background is I'm a practicing emergency physician or ER doctor. Um, What's the most unusual thing you found in a patient? Oh my God! Sorry, <laughs> I have to ask that. Yeah, I remember that. My probably the most memorable one is when I was a resident. Um, basically, a homeless person. He came in and he had a wound there, which is not. This was very typical that we see wounds in the emergency department. But this one was unique in that he had the maggots. Oh yeah. Wound. But the amazing thing about it, those maggots were actually cleaning off his dead skin cells and keeping the wound healthy and clean. Exactly. It was exactly. unbelievable. Native Americans used it for, for hundreds of years to, to keep wounds clean. So thank you for my, um, indulging me in that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, um, Drew, what made you apply for this license? Yeah, my background is in emergency medicine. So I, it's, it's, that position is more of a generalist. I'm not just focused on OBGYN. I kind of do all the fields. So I get to kind of see it all and I see a wide variety of patients. Um, also, my background is also, I, have a, I went to Tufts Medical School and then I got an MBA in healthcare finance. So when we started this whole thing, I, I did finish residency in Arizona and then I did a, became an attending for about five years and then it was a medical director of emergency department for about past two years. So Dr. Drews, how many patients uh, have you seen come into the emergency uh, overdosing on cannabis? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Uh, well, there's a university in Phoenix and it's very, the, I'm the closest ER to that, um, air, that, that university. So they keep me up to date on the designer drugs. And yeah, we have some, um, there's, it's not a problem. I, I don't, all I have to do is put an IV and put fluids in them at most and just watch them until they wake up. So sometimes they're in the emergency department sleeping eight hours, but there's, it's not a problem at all. It's a healthy sleep. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very easy patient for me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so what, you know, um, 
Duke, what made you apply for licenses? Was it a family thing? Yeah, it, it definitely was a family thing. Um, it, I, I actually, it kind of dovetails in, and goes into how we started it. With uh, we, I ground them up and said, "Hey, we should go to to Oaksterdam and figure out what to kind of get uh, get our foot in and understand what's going on." Um, and and I guess in general, we just started because we're all healthcare professionals and. Um, I think there's a real need to focus on patients, and that's where what we've been doing our whole lives is really patient care. So, sure. So, speaking of Oaksterdam, Joey, Joey, what do you do with Oaksterdam? You, yeah, I know you're the lead horticulturist for Green Therapeutics LLC, but you also have a connection with Oaksterdam. Tell yep. us about it. That's right. Yeah, I'm, I've been with Oaksterdam since uh, the very beginning, actually, in 2007. Uh, Oaksterdam University is, for those of you that don't know, is uh, in California, it's in Oakland, California, and it's the premier sort of lead um, cannabis college in the country. And we've taught over 20,000 students from around the world. Uh, I'm the lead horticulture instructor there, so I've helped develop our horticulture curriculum. Uh, but we teach about all things cannabis. You know, we talk about um, you know how to start your own business. We talk about patient advocacy. We talk about um, becoming involved uh, politically, and uh, but also looking at the medicinal benefits of the plant and um, and then looking to infuse that into the you know industry side of things our founder Richard Lee there was you know always really big on both you know being a patient advocate moving uh, the legal prospects forward uh, minimizing the issues around the prison industrial complex and 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 those things associated with uh with with cannabis and and looking at reforming that but also bringing in you know the the possibility of actually starting a business and making it uh a successful money-making venture at the same time well i heard that oaks Dam's coming to las vegas soon like the beginning of march maybe that's right yes uh uh oaks Dam is coming to vegas uh we at GT or Green Therapeutics were sponsoring um, two educational seminars here. There'll be four, four days uh, long. You can find out information on the Oaksterdam University website. But the first one will be a advanced horticulture uh, seminar over four days. It's 26 hours of instruction um, starting March 6th through the 9th. And um, for those you know patients and individuals out there interested in. Um, either growing their own, which is great that Nevada allows that, and hopefully we'll see uh, you know a laxing of the law or the limitations around that, because I know that that's going to come in, come into play as soon as dispensaries come online. But um, but yeah, so those are that are interested in growing their own and/or people looking to get um, you know employment in this industry. There are a lot of cultivation licenses that have gone out, and so um, there are going to be a lot of new jobs coming up, so that'll be some really good training for people that want to get into the growing aspect. So it's about, um, I've, I've actually looked at it, we, we, we were looking at it the other day, and it's about $1,000 for 26 hours. That's a pretty good value for what you're getting. Uh, I know you also get uh, like a, a huge um, study book with it um, of the materials that you can that you can print out. Um, and you have to sign waivers saying you'll never show it or you know won't reproduce it stuff like that but it's pretty good it's a pretty good value for the education 26 hours at about a thousand dollars yeah and it's it's going to be um where it's being held downtown which i love downtown vegas um at binions and it you know it the curriculum is really advanced it's um it's based on the the concept that we like students to have a uh, very hands-on learning experience uh, we're not gonna be able to do everything we do with the living grow lab we have in oakland but we've developed a really uh professional uh video a set of videos that really demonstrate so you're not just you know learning from a lecture and from the books uh, you're actually getting to see hands-on instruction on how to uh, to implement all these techniques and, and, and technologies that we'll learn about. So are those videos also going to be part of like the take-home materials where you can look at them later at home? Because I know when I'm when I'm in class and I'm studying something, I always go over my notes afterwards and I want to see the materials afterwards just to kind of solidify it in my brain. Um, so are you going to be able to view the videos afterwards? Uh, not yet, but those are going to become part of an online curriculum that Oaksterdam is putting up. So that will be available um, in online streaming form pretty soon. I think they're doing some fine tuning on the editing, but but actually it's great. So th that's actually com coming back to Green Therapeutics, how I met, um, I think uh, Duke mentioned it before, but how I met um, Drs. Drews, Duke and Amy, their sister, who's also a pharmacist. Um, they came and, and took the, the both of these uh, seminars that we're going to be bringing to Vegas uh, about a year ago right now. So we've been working together for the last year. 
Okay, well, thank you for that. And here's a question for everybody. Uh, in this competitive industry, like we have here in Nevada, you know how we are. <laughs> uh, how do you pl um, how do you plan to compete and rise above this field? And and what's your plans for that? Just by having great product. Yeah. You know, what What do you think the key to success is going to be here in Nevada? Yeah, the, there <clears throat> there are a lot of cultivators approved. So you know, our thought is for this is we have that from the medical team. Uh, you know, one, one of the reasons I came into this field is uh, is both we have the managerial and the operational experience in the healthcare field that's highly regulated, and also we have a, the, the the MBAs. Duke also has an MBA, and I have mine specific in healthcare finance. So we're just trying to bring our synergies for me that synergy of that degree and bring it to the cannabis field because it's both medical. It has the word medical in it. So we, we, our belief is that hopefully that's one of our strengths. Um, the other things a lot of the other team, uh, a lot, a lot of teams uh, also have, you know. But we 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 want plan to differentiate ourselves also with our production products, our infused products. So a bit along the medical lines, um, we're ta in partnership talks with obtaining the patents and formulations for a sublingual or the dissolving strip. Oh, right on. So you know, for people who prefer other delivery methods other than smoking it or oral ingestion, this is a quick delivery method. I think those those be for the indications with those pediatric seizures. Uh, when those other medications don't work, that's something that's very nice and very fast. Also, transdermal patches. So uh, traditionally in the medical field, it'd be like pain patches or lidocaine patches, but this one would be infused with, with the, the psychoactive compounds in the cannabis. So what's the delivery compound, the cross-skin delivery compound? Is it dimethyl sulfioxide or something different? Or do you, or do you or into the no that, part I, of that I can hear that that the, the, the non-disclosure on the partnership agreement saying oh. no <laughs> okay yeah they've kept that secret they have a special um, binding material that binds the the psychoactive compound to the sublingual formulation strip and then so they have a patent on that okay all right um, thank you uh, thank you dr. Drews. Um Duke the same question to you well I like I would say the same thing as Drews would say um, uh, as far as the uh, differentiating ourselves with products um, and kind of helping the industry as far as as far as like a resource possibly for kind of marrying the tube together the the, the, the traditional medical world and the the canvas industry and that's what we would ideally hope to bring some of that uh, traditional traditional medicine and bridge it with with what's going on in the cannabis yeah I, I mean a further extension other than the, our products is like we would we'd love to do kind of push the boundaries of the medical aspect of this um, you know we, we we know about seizures but you know there's research going on with dr. Sisley and post-traumatic stress disorder so we I want to come up kind of try to push the field um, and working with dispensaries it can be as simple as like a pamphlet for physicians because more and more physicians are going to have patients that are on this medication you review this medication that's 20 you know 20 drugs long and then cannabis is on there so if we can even offer information to physicians if we can connect with you know other physicians who are doing studies on these academic institutions who are getting funding for this i would be love to get involved even at a, a neurologist who just needs some guidance on a dosing for a pediatric or a seizure patient that's failed conventional therapy so Anything along those lines, that's all kind of in our strategy. We're just kind of stuck right now in the sure. building and planning phase. But yeah, anyone out there, you know, later on we'll give our website, but anyone who wants to contact us and reach out, I would love to do something medical and, and actually use our, our synergy and degrees in this business and medic medicine and really try to help some patients in a new way. Sure, Joey, what strains are you going to be blowing up here for us in Nevada? Oh, that's that's a good question. Well, we're, <laughs> we're actually, um, we are, we, we have a few varieties. I'm a big fan of kryptonite. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I and uh, there's, um, we, we have quite a few varieties on our menu, um, or we will, but we're also uh, still in the search right now. A lot of when you ask about the competitive advantage, we're, we're looking, we're, we know that this is a competitive market, but we really are looking at the collaborative side of things and, and seeing that as how we can actually sort of rise above the field and that if we can partner with dispensaries and, and that have the direct access to patients uh, that give us, you know, they say, you know, our Some patients guidance. are really exactly the guidance. We're really looking for these varieties. Those are the kinds of things that we want to make available. We're very adaptable. You know, I have a lot of experience. I've been growing for 20 years. So, um, you know, 
give me a variety you want me to grow and I can track it down and, and, and grow it for you. So, so that's one thing we're looking to do. We also have been in talks with, we can't really name them yet, but um, some pretty high-end, um, well-known uh, production partners that that offer well-known, you know, edible and and drink and uh, like chocolate type products and things. So we're we're we really want to help bring those things to uh, to the market here. And they ha they even have their own varieties that they like to use as their sort of signature raw their materials base. for their for their products. So sure. we're kind of basing a lot of our decisions on on strain selection on those partnerships. That's all that stuff sounds really exciting. How can we get a hold of you? How can we reach out and, and touch you, <laughs> so to speak? I'm sorry. <laughs> I just caught myself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, our, we, um, we do have a website, which is um, www.greentherapeuticslasvegas.com. And uh, we also have a Facebook page. Um, but I would say the best way to get, which you can definitely contact us through both of those. Um, uh, the best way to to find us in the near future is going to be through um, our our collaboration with Oaksterdam um, in the seminars, and I think I mentioned earlier, but there's um, there's going to be a second follow up one in April or May. It's the the date is still being finalized, but uh, keep an ear out for that. Uh, where uh, there's also a, a job fair incorporated into that. I know uh, we can just recently did a job fair, and I think that's an important part of building really a local industry, not just out of state experts and people coming in, but really trying to educate and train and, and hire local folks. So that's um, that's going to be the probably the soonest opportunity to meet us, and and maybe uh, maybe we'll end up you know hiring you. So. Joey, can you hear that website again? Because if anyone wants to contact me to do anything medical, like you can contact us through the website. Greentherapeutics.com? Uh, Las Vegas. Greentherapeutics Las Vegas. And it's all spelled out. Greentherapeutics Las Vegas? Correct. Okay, dot com. And um, that was uh, Dr. Drew's Fu. Uh, and if you'd like to get a hold of him, it's greentherapeuticslasvegas.com. Uh, and that's for the medical connection. All right, we're going to be going on a break right now. And when we come back, we'll have our 420 moment. We'll talk to you soon. Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required. We have a doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Green Spot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas-based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies. Locally owned and operated with over 3,000 square feet of inventory. Expert and friendly staff to help you with all your growing and hydroponic needs. Our pricing and service will not be beat. We help you grow. 3355 Westlake Mead Boulevard, just behind the Texas station. Mention we can and receive 10% off. Call us at 702-463-6000. That's 702-463-6000. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. <laughs> Welcome back. That sound indicates it's time for our 420 moment. And today we're going to honor Miley Cyrus. Oy! <laughs> Miley Cyrus was born November 23rd, 1992. And uh, she's an American singer, <laughs> if you call her that, songwriter and actress. <laughs> her father is Billy Ray Cyrus. And she held minor roles in the television series Doc and, uh, and the film Big Fish in her childhood. Well, she was also, what, Hannah Montana for years. Yep. <laughs> okay. So you can't forget that part. Um, in April t 2014, Madonna announced that Miley Cyrus would be the greatest curator for the month for Art for Freedom, a global digital initiative designed to fuel free speech to respond to address and protest pro persecution and discrim discrimination around the world. 
Well, Cyrus uh, was born with a heart condition called tachycardia. That means her resting heart rate exceeded the normal. In early 2014, uh, Cyrus suffered from allergy reaction to antibiotics. Uh, Ciflexin prescribed to treat her sinus infection. And due to her allergy, she was hospitalized in the Kansas City Hospital. Um, she is a big proponent of medical cannabis and medical marijuana. And she uses medical cannabis to treat her various conditions there you go um <laughs> okay is one of her conditions being a wrecking ball uh, <laughs> now every time i every time i hear that it reminds me of the disturbing one did you see the ron jeremy redid wrecking ball and oh my re God. reenacted the whole video just like her <laughs> yeah yeah i can't get that image out of my head once you see that Okay, so we have a caller on the line. We have Dennis on the line. Dennis. Good afternoon, guys. How are you guys doing today? What's up, bud? What's going on? Um, I have a question for the uh, for the cultivation centers that were coming in. The strands that they're offering to bring in, are those being developed here locally in the state, or are they being brought in from California from their Osterdam? Ooh, good, good question. Ooh, the, the big, scary question that nobody yeah, wants so to talk is, about. Yeah, it's a major thing of being a, you know, it's a local, state-operated business. Right. I believe, you know, our businesses should be generated locally and operated generally from the local businesses from the state, not from out of state bringing their product in. Sure, sure. Well, ev everything will definitely be cultivated here, and there's a lot of work that I've seen uh, from multiple groups looking at um, uh, developing new varieties, sort of tailoring varieties and hybrids that, that are going to speak to hopefully the conditions and the needs of local patients, and, and that should all be done here under state law. The weird thing is, is that you have this difference between state and federal law where, you know, plants, flowers, seeds, nothing can cross state lines. And so with these new uh, medical and, and adult use laws coming online in different states, you sort of have this situation where where are the magic plants going to appear from out of nowhere where there was previously right. no legal legal market. And so Nevada came up with an interesting workaround on that where they are um, allowing local patients to, uh, to grow for themselves. And um, they don't really ask a lot of questions on where those plants uh, originated from or how they got here. Uh, but the licensed uh, uh, medical operators here that are going to be coming online here soon, cultivators, have to get their plants from patients, Nevada patients directly. So they're not allowed to bring them in from out of state. Um, so that's about where they left it. And there, there's still obviously a lot of questions on you know how that's all going to work out uh but 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 it is going to be they are they do have to be locally sourced and all that has to be documented with local patients and you know yeah, you right. guys know that i have a huge huge patient base with a lot of different strains i think we i have over like 60 different strains from local people here that are willing to sell their their cannabis and and their strains to you guys uh so maybe we can connect and work work that that's kind of why i was asking you what strains you wanted and sure. I, I have some OG kryptonite right now. Blue Dream, <laughs> right. actually Blue Dream kryptonite. Oh, it's Blue Dream kryptonite. Blue, yeah. yeah, well, and, and also just, you know, just to clarify this, the state only allows for the uh, transfer with no compensation. So that's, that that is obviously a, a challenging hurdle because, you know, um, well, these are businesses that are, well, actually, that are starting up. We, and, and and actually, it, that's not true. Yeah, there's a, there is a one-time buy for, for yes. all the patients to sell to either grows or dispensaries that they can sell one time to give them their strains. So. It, and it is the state law. And, and I was on the committee that helped put that together, so I know I will be getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's great. That's great. That'll help out a lot. Yeah, especially for in this sure. early phase. Well, that answers, that answers my question. Thank okay. you very much. Thank, Thank you, you Dennis. Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis. Have a good day. Yeah. And if anyone else has any other questions out there, feel free to call in at 702-731-1230. And it looks like we have a busy week this week. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. We have uh, AGE that's going to be the, finishing up the next couple of days. We have our Super Bowl party coming up on Saturday, the 31st. Now, I've had some questions about that, and I'd like to answer them. No, there is not football involved with this party, other than we're going to be playing 420 football. It's Super Bowl Saturday party, the pre 
uh, Super Bowl party. The pre pre Super Bowl. Yeah. The pre pre Super Bowl party. A and different type of Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> a Super Bowl. <laughs> and today is the first day to file for municipal office. So if you want to run for mayor or city council, that opportunity is open up now throughout Henderson, North Vegas, Las Vegas. And it's interesting what's going on uh, here in uh, Las Vegas. Really? Oh, yeah. Carolyn Goodman's right hand, Stavros Anthony, is running against her. Wow, and, man. Snuck up on her, huh? Well, he's all pissed off about the soccer stadium deal and well, her he, support of that and her pushing it through. So he's just like, well, to hell with it. I'm just going to run against you if you're going to you know, run uh, this down my throat. So he, here also, we are. he also sees it as a huge opportunity for fundraising for a campaign because there's some big casinos out there that are against that, that soccer deal also. So now he can turn to them and say hey well of course campaign. you know because it's the room taxes that'll pay for the uh for the stadium you know there's been a lot of a lot of you know push and pull about you know where that money's coming from and since we're on it i'll talk about it for five seconds you know everyone says oh you know i don't want to pay for the soccer stadium because my tax dollars are going for it well you know it's not actually nevadans tax dollars that are going to pay for it if you look at it it's room taxes and nevadans don't pay the room taxes, tourists pay the room taxes, and I understand where people are barking about how, well, you know, uh, it's coming out of the Parks and Recreation Bill and things like that. They're like, we're not going to build any new parks, but, you know, we're getting a soccer stadium with giant parks attached to it. So, you know, I'm, I'm fine with people being able to vote on the issue as long as the actual truth be told when people say, well, let's talk about public funding. Well, let's have that conversation about what is public funding and what do we actually do with it. You know, a park and recreation department isn't supposed to turn a profit it's supposed to provide parks and recreation for the public so you know that's just where i'm at with it well i got another side note on that you know Savros anthony is an ex-police officer right he's anti-medical marijuana let me say that both him and our good mayor right now are anti-medical marijuana and her even husband though, was all for it and even though she'll it. tell you oh but i got a relative in philadelphia and da 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 hypocrite I'm well, sorry. no, I mean, her husband was all for it, um, and her son went for a license. Ross Goodman came to our first symposium. I think that's one of the th I think she doesn't like that, though, when people are like, oh, well, people will say that, well, Oscar and this guy are for it. Well, she's not Oscar, and I don't think she likes being compared so much to him i don't i think she kind of likes to stand on her own feet and she kind of resents cause some of that, you know, that yeah, piggybacking she does. uh uh, mentality that people think she's doing, you know. I think. Well, she you wants know, to it would only do her mirror. good. Everybody liked Oscar. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but how many times does she keep re comparing her administration to her husband's administration? Of course, if you keep comparing yourself, then the electorate, then your citizens are going to compare you. Oscar Goodman was reelected with something in the high ninety percent. Uh, re-election yeah with yeah, zero so. money towards his campaign <laughs> zero <too. laughs> mm -hmm. that's 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 unheard of so you I know mean, we like our mobs they, they, they almost changed the the uh they almost changed the rules to let him run longer i think all right anyway, you guys i digress yeah let's go and talk about washow okay. uh you almost think there's a glaucoma epidemic going on in lake tahoe with all those all those dispensaries three dispensaries within five miles <laughs> and within what three miles of the border uh, so who are they pandering to, really? Well, didn't you say that's where all the money is in that area, too? It is Tourist in North town. Shore. It is in North Shore. My parents lived there for years. They had a house there for years, and it was just like, you know, you could see the money dripping off these people. Wouldn't you think the big money area would be more, like, socially conservative, though, and they wouldn't want the dope in their fancy neighborhoods or something like that? That's so funny it's that they would be so capitalistic about it. It's a ski resort town. It is a ski resort town, okay. and they are People like to go get partiers. high on the slope. Yeah, drinkers, partiers. Fair enough. It's all, it's all about. Um, well, there is a lawsuit uh, filed by attorneys for Washout Dispensary LLC, and you may have guessed it, they were snubbed for one of these licenses, whereas Trike got two licenses, out, or three licenses out of 10. That's 30% of the market right there. They, and they said there was going to be no market, you know, market monopolies going on. That's a big one right there. What do you think is going to happen with that? You think people are going to get away with that? I, I don't think it is because uh, the attorney for uh, Washoe Dispensary, uh, Audre Senepa, said, <laughs> said the state followed, failed to follow its own law. And with them giving 30% of the market share, it's obvious that they did fail to follow their own law. But that was the argument used here in uh, southern Nevada as well. 
Well, all right. So we'll see how that battle uh, that battle develops as time goes on. Well, in Reno, Rand Paul is supporting growing hemp. Yeah, well, remember he was down here in Las Vegas uh, earlier, uh, just recently before that, and he was presented with the hemp jacket. I did a, covered that on the news last week. Well, he was wearing his hemp jacket up there, and he uh, said somebody gave him one, and he jokingly asked if he was breaking any laws by wearing it. And he put on his new hemp jacket and uh, had some pictures taken in it. Well, and Senator Seeger Bloom is up there pushing for the hemp initiative, and, you know, he's our champion down here also. Um, he, he's noted that jo George Washington grew hemp. Um, he's, they, he's sponsoring something like, what, five of the eight current uh, of cannabis um, BDRs up at legislature. And so he said that we should all have a uh, medical marijuana day up at uh, the legislature in Carson City. I'm looking forward to that one. Maybe. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I would definitely go up to Carson for a Go Green Day. I'll smoke up. I mean, show up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you guys. Session runs through on? April, doesn't it? Session runs through 420? Yes, I think session does run through 420. So okay. maybe, I, you know, I don't want se the, the medical marijuana day to be 420 up there because I've got too much stuff going on down here for sure. But I what will was show the day, up. What was the day last year that the bill passed? Wasn't the, like the, la wasn't the last it day was of session? It was the last uh, that would week be or fine. last day of that would session. Be, we'll, we'll find something. You know, people were just uh, jockeying that Find thing something. around till the end. Everybody was sweating. I got a little bit of news out of Reno. What's up? There's uh, something about a campaign debt story. Uh, shortly after the mayor, Hillary Sheevy of Reno, was elected, she sent out a plea to her campaign donors to help her pay off the debt she took in running against civil engineer Ray Pezzanella. According to a new report filed today, a cadre of developers, lobbyists, and medical marijuana companies answered the call, contributing more than $26,000 to the new mayor after Election Day. Mm -hmm. She also took in about seven grand in the days just before the election from police and fire unions, a title loan company, and a telecommunications pack. She held a fundraiser on December 4th to help pay off personal loans made to her mayoral and at large council campaigns. Her mayoral campaign included a crowded primary battle and ended up costing $316,000. She raised about $345,000, falling shy of the record set by Mayor Bob Cashel in 2000, uh, 2002. He raised $366,000. Uh, but you know the point of the the point of the art, uh, article is that medical marijuana companies, for the first time probably, are helping these politicians pay off their post-election debt before they gear up for these new battles it's kind of interesting to see that already they're starting to flex their muscle a little bit without even opening the doors they're seeing the advantages of you know scratching the backs of the people that have scratched theirs because of course you know blackrock nutraceuticals and forever green llc are two of the companies that were helping to donate to her campaign and you know this is nothing new a lot of a lot of politicians have outstanding campaign debt and they always reach out during that that period post-election. I mean, I got reached out to by a couple of people, and it's yeah. just uh, I like I like to see that actually that they're kind of they're putting it up and uh, making moves. Right on. Don't forget, she also sat on, sat on that legislative committee too. Yeah, she did. Oh yeah, she did, huh? All right, you guys. Um, well, one question I do have is: Doesn't BlackRock Pharmaceuticals tied to the GMOs, making cannabis GMOs product? I don't know about that blackrock nutraceuticals i would have to look that up i'm not familiar with that you would probably know more than i oh okay well just putting it out there jennifer look and find out <laughs> i will okay i have from business insider now's the time for obama to move on marijuana um president obama already did his damn the torpedoes stay the unit address and now he is, uh, he should, they're saying he should try to finish with a flourish if you want the judges to be kind. In other words, to secure his legacy, Obama needs to go out with a bang. I've been saying that for this last session that he's been in, that he should just remove it from class one controlled substance to something like maybe a class three to class five. I mean, cocaine is a class two for heaven's sake. You know, well, I mean, when when the federal and and this this is what frustrates me to no extent, the federal government and we we've covered this ad nauseum, but the federal <laughs> government provides cannabis to like what seven patients, they have uh, that big grow area that they have, you know, was over a thousand square feet of grow, 
and then you're going to turn around in federal court and argue that it has no medical purposes. Well, then excuse the hell out of me. Why are you providing it to seven patients then if it has no medical value? So what do you think, Dr. Drews? Yeah, it is It is class one. And, you know, class one are basically drugs that they have of no better medical benefit and have been deemed to be a risk to the patient. Like LSD and heroin is, are all one controlled substances class one, aren't they? Yeah. Yes, they are. And then class two, yeah, I agree with your classification system down to three and five because, you know, like morphine pills such as Percocet and those things, those are already class three. So, yeah, uh, the amount of harm and the thing, the thing and the class three relative to the medical marijuana is, is it's negligible. Very, very, yeah, yeah, for negligible. sure. Negligible. Yeah, for I sure. heard a statistic that more people are dying of prescription drug overdoses than in car accidents in the United States now. Absolutely. Which it's is just unbelievable. The uh, yeah, the narcotics or morphine pills, Percocet, those things, it's an epidemic. Um, it's Is it's that really, why they really recently sad. stepped up hydrocodone to Schedule 2 recently? Is that what that was all about, is to try to lessen the flow? Yeah, it's more of a, like, educating side. This is a real problem, and it's like we're part of the problem as physicians who are prescribing this. But, you know, it's very difficult in this healthcare environment because the patient has so much power. And right. so it's very difficult for even physicians, even though I see this guy every day coming to my emergency department with a different pain and trying to get pills for me, you know, I still have to take care of him and evaluate them because like, you know, he'll come in 50 times out of the year trying to get medicine for me. One of those times he's going to have a real medical condition. So it's a really tough position for us. Right. It's a real problem. I've had many patients in the emergency department who are clearly addicted because they come to me and try to get to me, even though I tell them no. So, you know, he's hitting multiple hospitals. And over time, you get to know these people. They have families. They're young. They're the elderly. They're 80 years old. They're young and have families of 20 years old. And some of these people, over three years, they pass away. You know, I've had a couple of patients who've switched to medical marijuana, and they've half their dosage. Yeah. And they actually don't die in three years. So it's those kind of stories are very dramatic to me. Yeah, we're, well, getting, uh, we're getting a lot of patients come to us that are wanting to switch to medical marijuana from the opiates and that just because they they've tightened down the restrictions on them so much they're like i have to go back every 30 days to get another prescription to get my pills and they'll only give me 30 days worth and yeah i can't travel and i can't do this mm -hmm. so they're they're coming to us and and asking about medical cannabis because they're just tired of one being on the pills and two going through the whole rigmarole to get them yeah for, and then with withdrawals if they have breakthrough pain and they use too many of the pills then they have withdrawals that have um significant physical um you know uh, side effects oh, you absolutely. know anxiety vomiting you know diarrhea um you know you know sweating uh tremors. a lot of cold sweats and everything because i, w I was on uh Vicodin for seven years and that's one of the reasons I moved out here to Nevada was it was a medical marijuana state and you know I honestly got tired of taking pills every single day just get out of bed you know and the effects I haven't taken a pill in over a year and I can awesome. tell you I feel like a million times better yeah <laughs> lots of side effects and yeah withdrawal symptoms I have to admit patients because the withdrawals are so bad yeah, I mean, and it can go even into seizures. Uh, alcohol has seizures also from withdrawals. But some of these opiates, people that can't get the opiates are then turning to heroin. And heroin addiction is Correct. now on the rise here That's in Nevada. taking over the streets. Yeah, yeah a, as a consequence of this. People don't know that this bill that tightened down um, these Class 2 and Class 3 controlled substances was also brought to us by Senator Tick Seegerbloom. Um, at the I same, did not know that. At the same time that he brought us dispensaries uh, in legislative session, he uh, pass, uh, helped pass a bill that tightened down the restrictions on prescriptions here in Nevada because of the rampant addiction and use here in Nevada. And you know what helps with uh, the symptoms of withdrawal from those pills? Cannabis. Cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been curious to experiment with that, whether... You know, like people suffering from withdrawal from heroin overdose or heroin addiction or something like that could benefit from from cannabis use in, in a controlled environment. Well, I, I mean, there's I don't think there's any been any like controlled studies done on it, but you know, I would be curious to see. I've got family members who basically kind of, uh, you know, we experimented with. They had cannabis. I gave them cannabis coconut capsules because I could put one ml in each tablet yeah. and know the know the dosage and gave him the cannabis coconut capsules and she said it you know it was great it really worked and then i said well okay just let's switch over to the cannabis coconut capsules and, and lessen and lessen your narcotics and you know <laughs> that wasn't met well but you know we're i'm hoping i'm hoping <laughs> okay we have a break coming up more news after the break and perry's got a story from the army
Uh oh. Finally, Nevada medical marijuana dispensaries are opening, but you must have your medical marijuana card to get inside. Call the friendly team at Karma Holistic Health Foundation, toll free, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Karma Holistic Health Foundation will give you legal access to medical marijuana. All veterans receive a discount, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702-218-5226 or Kurt, K-U-R-T, at WeCan702.org. Hi, welcome back to Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I have Kurt Dukoch to my right, uh, Perry Haichu, Raymond Fletcher. We also have Dr. Drew Fu in the house. Lawrence is making us sound good on the board. And Perry, what do you got for me? I know you were telling me you need you needed to talk about something, get something off your chest. What's up? Oh, no, no. There's just a story that... Uh doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It seems as though the army is sending letters to dispensary owners in Washington state instructing them not to sell cannabis or cannabis related products to members of the armed forces or they might be brought before a disciplinary commission in order to answer for what they're doing and it just seems funny to me because military members are already expressively you know they're already prohibited from using cannabis while on active duty or whether they're in the reserves or not. So it's just kind of funny for for me to uh, see them place the burden on the dispensary owners to now screen all their patients and say, well, you know, are you a member of the armed forces? You know, we can't sell to you or whatever. It's just like, this is recreationally legal and it's up to the individual person to be responsible for themselves. You know, I don't really like collective responsibility or pushing responsibility onto people who we have enough to deal with. You know, dispensary owners already have enough to deal with. And it just seems to me that it's just another way for government to kind of butt in a little bit unnecessarily. And it seems as though the amount of problems they do have in the army, like veterans committing suicide and things like that, the army could really be focusing their limited resources as they call them on more proactive uh, problems. And not to mention, if the, if these people in the military know they're not supposed to be using this, it's not like they're walking into these stores in full camo and handing them their military IDs. Well, some <laughs> of them have been this. using their military ID. That's the thing I think has been uh, one of the problems is that, you know, uh, I mean, m- maybe if you're, they're using their military ID, they should just tell them, hey, you know, you might get in trouble, but maybe not. Like I said, I just don't know. It just seems a little like, it seems like nonsense to me, but uh, uh uh, I was just going to say you moved it on me. You <laughs> moved it on me. Um, it, it was uh, um, and the, the story has a good uh, argument. What, what if the uh, member of the military just walks in the street clothes? You know how are you supposed to know? How are he you has a high to? and tight. That's a military it's cut, by the way. It's his haircut. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so her profile would be, I'm not going to sell you grass because uh, you look like you're in the army. Sorry. Yeah, you yeah. might want to change your barber. So what What you say is, attention! <laughs> and if they stand up really straight, they have like a twitch. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you yell at them and they respond to it. Yeah. Well, I got a story from Alaska. All right. A story for, you know, um, Alaska legislators push for involvement in new regulation process the Alaska legislature held it first held its first official meeting on Thursday for ballot measure two 
and they're looking to you know get these committees organized to get this measure rolling but really that's not the story the real story is that the legislature right after forming that little subcommittee introduced senate bill 30 which is going to fundamentally change the initiative that voters passed in november and this story is for the campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol in alaska uh-huh. basically since the people of alaska voted it in they're like well we can't have these people voting on what they want we're just going to pass a legislative bill to screw them over and totally flip the bill up on its head which is exactly Isn't that against the law no of course not they they can do whatever they want it's the legislature they can totally pass the bill as long as it's after the ballot initiative comes out this is exactly what happened in alaska in 1998 when they had their first medical marijuana law they're like oh we'll have a we don't be, uh, trust the legislature to push it through so we'll do a ballot initiative they do it passes boom they pass the bill the next uh legislative year Flipping it upside down on its head, banning the dispensaries, banning this, banning that. And here we are doing the same exact thing all over again. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, do, 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 let's see. The bill is going to do away with many important legal protections enacted by voters. It repeals entire sections of the initiative, including those related to personal possession, personal cultivation, and lawful operation of marijuana facilities, and then simply adds a defense onto the books for those activities. This is a lesser protection than what the voters had mandated, and, will, and, and the state has previously used it, this tactic to thwart the will of the voters in the case of the medical marijuana bill, which passed by Citizen Initi- Initiative in 1998. This will clearly undermine the will of the nearly 150,000 Alaskans who voted yes on ballot measure two. Now, what it means by adding a defense onto the books for those activities is simple. What that means is it's a proact- it's a, a, an affirmative defense. They're going to let you still get arrested and go to jail, but decriminalization is now a defense that you can use when you go to court. Oh, but you still got your crap. But you still have up. to deal with it, yeah. You still so got your it's, seizures. It's, this is complete BS. And it really, I think, is going to pump the brakes on a lot of people looking to foray into the Alaska legal market. Well, isn't that what they're doing in Washington, D.C. right now? The will of the people is trying to be circumvented up there, too? This is different. This is a congressional issue in Washington, D.C. Congress, Washington, D.C. exists as a separate federal entity. It's not a state. It doesn't have the same rights as the states do. That's why there's this weird clause in the Constitution that allows Congress to override ballot initiatives even within the district. So that one guy, I think it was Andy Harris from Maryland, who proposed that uh, that he slipped in that uh, line item into that big spending bill that got yeah. that thrown out, which is why a lot of people would like to see the president have a line item veto ability in some of these things, so he could go in and you know write some of those things out, and you know it's just government at work. But yeah, it's definitely circumventing the will of the people, and I can't imagine what the people in Alaska that pushed so hard and did all this legwork, this grassroots work, are feeling right now. They just got to be unbelievably frustrated. But the mayor of D.C. is moving forward with it anyway, so God bless his heart. I heard they're just going to try to do it anyway and just ignore it. Yeah, and what it is with D.C. is uh, Congress has has, a right of approval of all their laws. Okay. Okay, but so I'm going to bounce around right quick. Okay, let's Uh, see it. (laughs) <laughs> okay, uh, when, when uh, Perry was talking about the Army news that was out of Washington State, and something out of Washington State caught my eye because we were dealing the same thing here in Vegas. A Washington judge has ruled medical marijuana advertising ban is unconstitutional. Yay! The judge, judge uh, found that the state's law banning cannabis advertisement violates both state and federal law by curtailing free speech. The judge stated... I find the statute impermissibly overbroad as it chills even informational speech aimed solely at public education. And I think that's a very important line there. And anyone that's moved forward in the city of Las Vegas, the county of Clark, or anywhere should pay attention to that ruling. So legalize it. Right. We'll advertise it. We, we were talking a little bit last week about Eric Holder wants asset forfeiture laws. He restricts them, um, and he uh, he changed the policy, 
Um, that people have to be actually convicted? Yes. Yeah, whole, that's a good one. I mean, whole, we can't just steal your crap on uh, on a thought that you might be doing something wrong. And that's what they've been doing, uh, uh, you know, traditionally. Well, it's guilty, like they go in, in the they go in and they steal your stuff. They tear up your house. And then you've got to prove that you're not doing anything. And maybe you'll get it back. But Eric Holder is going to, like, overturn that and let people not get their stuff stolen by the cops That's on exactly a whim. What it was. And look, we were talking about that Texas officer that sold the medical cannabis from that husband and wife. But mm -hmm. this states that local and state law enforcement no longer are able to use federal asset forfeiture laws to seize and keep property without evidence of a crime. Yeah, so that'll just that'll stem some of the tide. This is why this is why a lot of people don't want cannabis to be legal. They don't want medical cannabis to be legal is because it's such a huge business for law enforcement. Asset seizure and asset forfeiture is huge money. How do you think that they they get those big tanks and those Hummers and those drones and stuff like that? It's because they arrest so many people and they get their assets, then the federal government will give them money. Because because they've arrested so many people for narcotics. I've heard stories that police departments have wish lists that they're looking for and they look for things to go seize and they look for, you know, people to not necessarily purposefully exploit, but if they see the opportunity, they'll definitely take it so they can go ahead and get those those, you know, cars that they wanted or they can get that gear that they feel like their department needs or, you know, this that and the other and it really is policing for profit as they call it. And uh, it, it, it's just kind of disappointing. Well, that, with the for-profit prison you know. system, people that are arrested, uh, and if you have stock in that prison system as a police officer, basically you're acting as an agent for that stock. Well, since 2008, over $3 billion in assets and forfeitures by the government. Oh, and also, when you were talking about, you know, where do they get the tanks? Where do they get these crazy stuff? Well, there was another uh, Pentagon program after 9-11 that repurposes a lot of military equipment to the police departments for free. If the Pentagon has all this, you know, mine-resistant uh, trucks and armored personnel carriers that they can't use, if a police department comes to them and says, we want it, and they have it, they'll just give it to them for free. And they do it all the time. That's where they're getting all this military military gear. Is it's coming straight from the military. So. So the know. militarization of the police departments yeah. is oh, actually yeah. become coming at their request. Well, yeah. Instead it's, of protecting and serving, they're coming in. It's at an a indirect a result of the level. wind down of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. They have all this stuff, and they're just like, well, we just don't want to give it away to anyone. We'll just give it away to our our domestic warriors. You know, who are now facing this homegrown terrorist possibilities. You know, you see what happened in, in Paris and things like that, you know, with that uh, in Mumbai and, you know, the, the mall in Kenya and places like that. So that's why these police departments will justify. They'll say, well, look, we need this kind of stuff in case something like that happens here. So that's where that that's where that stuff comes from. I don't know. Uh, you think that there could be a next up uprising in America? Hell yeah. And I'm leading it. <laughs> you know, oh, well, okay, well, hold on. I, I got a little statement on that, too. People ask me sometimes, well, we're going to have a revolution, a revolution in this country. And I'm like, look, America uses more power on air conditioning than all the other countries in the world put together. We're not revolting against nothing. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, let's hope they stand up and revolt and, and repeal prohibition. I think that's our next uprising. Uh, you know, I think that if there's too many too many legislatures just quashing the will of the people, that people will stand up and say no. But you know, as traditionally, cannabis activists are pacifists. Really, I, I don't see a lot of violent cannabis people. Yeah, but I think they're at the point now where they're just fed up with the lies, and you know, and we've grown in so much. We're 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 the we're the majority, and and a huge majority, not just a simple majority. So I think it's time. Well, we're gaining our own amount of legislative and political influence through the amount of money that the industry is garnering. It's just as simple as that. And that's why I feel, you know, everyone's like, I want Obama to legalize it today. I'm terrified of that. If that happens tomorrow, if Obama gets on TV and starts smoking a joint tomorrow, we got big problems, like I've said time and again. Big, big companies like, you know, Philip Morris, Richard Reynolds, they'll come in and swoop right down on us. Monsanto will be growing our grass and people like us who want to get get going get these businesses up and rolling we'll just be rolled right under their their feet we got to get 
you know, we got to get bigger understand. before they before we allow that to happen. People don't understand why I'm against legalization in Nevada. I'm like, we need to get going with the medical in Nevada and then get get the complete legalization in Nevada going. Well, we're not rolling over, but you can roll on down to our Super Bowl <laughs> Saturday party, January 31st. From 1 to 5, go to our meetup page, get the address and everything else. Uh, filing is open if you want to file for a municipal office. February 6th is first Friday. Champs is next week. Legislative session starts February 2nd. All right, everybody uh, from Nevada Cannabis News, be safe out there.